Today's lesson is about the SI system or the System International and there's a bullet point list of things I'm going to go over. I'm going to try to do this about two minutes per unit so this should be about ten minutes long. Alright, first one, prefixes and units. Now there's three examples. You got kiloliter, that's this big one, which is a kilo is a thousand times bigger than a liter, which is the base unit for volume and a milliliter is a thousand times smaller than a liter. So basically what this picture is showing you is that a thousand of these small ones, the milliliters, could fit inside of here, and a thousand of the liters could fit inside of here. Okay, just a way to visualize this. Now, uh, three main units that we need to know, the units for length, which is meters, units for mass, which is grams, and the units for time, which is seconds. So those are the three, what we call base units. Uh, let me explain one thing. Kilograms are what we use in physics, because grams are tiny, so in the physics world it's typically going to be less common They'd be measuring things in grams. So we use something called the MKS system, which is also known as the System International. Okay, so the SI system. The only thing is we use kilograms instead of grams, so don't get confused by that. All right, I'm going to show you a list of prefixes here. Giga is a billion, mega is a million, kilo is a thousand, hecto, hundred, deca, ten. Base units are right there. Below the base units, you go smaller now. Deci is one divided by ten, or ten to the negative first. Centi is 1 divided by 100, milli is 1 divided by 1,000, micro is 1 divided by a million, and nano is 1 divided by a billion. Okay, so that's what those prefixes mean. Here's the scientific notation for each prefix in this column here. And then these are the symbols for the prefixes. So if you see a G in front of some other unit, you know that it's talking about giga, which is a billion. So here's a few examples down here. In one kilometer, there's 1,000 meters. In one centigram, there's 0 0.01 grams, because that's one divided by a hundred. Okay, this one's off the screen a little bit, but a decimeter is 0.1 meters. Uh, micrometer is one divided by a million, so it looks like that. Nano is one divided by a billion, so it's even tinier. And then a millisecond is one divided by a thousand. Okay? All right, here's a quick example. If you want to see how many centimeters are in one meter, I can tell you right now it's a hundred. So what you would do on this metric ladder, you start wherever you are originating with. So that would be meters. So meters are right here in the middle. To get to centimeters, you've got to take two steps down the ladder to the right, which means if the decimal started here with one meter, you'd move it two times to the right, which gives you one zero and another zero, which is 100. Okay? So as many steps as you take on the ladder, that's how many times you move the decimal that way. If you wanted to go from meters to kilometers, you're going to be going from base units up three steps to the left, so you go from 576.5 to .5765. Okay, three steps to the left. It's called the metric ladder. It's a real simple way to do this. All right, two types of units. We already talked about the base units. Well, certain quantities we talk about in here combine the base units to form what we call derived units. So the units for force are newtons, and that's basically mass times distance divided by time squared. So all these units on the right are different combinations of the base units, which makes them derived units. All right. I'm going to teach you something that's probably the most important thing right now for the skills you got to have to be a scientist or an engineer. This one's called the factor label method. In math, you might call it uh, unit canceling or the conversion method, unit conversions. It's real simple. If you want to go from 75 centimeters to meters, like you are in this example, you uh, first write down the number you're starting with as a fraction. 75 centimeters over 1 is how you would write that. Okay. Now steps 2 and 3 are telling you that you want to put the units you're trying to cancel out, which in this case is centimeters, you want to put them opposite to where they are where you're starting. So right here they're on the top of the fraction. So on the next one over, you put them on the bottom. And then the units that you're trying to get into, you put them right up here above that. So there's meters. Okay? You look up the conversion in a table. Okay, so one meter equals 100 centimeters. And then you put the numbers in place where they go. So one goes in front of the M for meters, and 100 goes in front of the centimeters because that's where you have your 100 for centimeters. Okay. The last step is to just multiply and cancel out the units. Now centimeters divided by centimeters, they're going to cancel out. So you end up with 75 meters divided by 100, which is just 0.75 meters. Pretty simple. All right, moving right along. We're talking about scientific notation. Now scientific notation is a way of talking about really big and also really small numbers, which makes it really important in science because we talk about the very, very big and the very, very small. There's always 
two parts to writing a number in scientific notation. There's the number part, for example, 1.25, and then there's the factor that the multiplied the number gets multiplied with. Okay? The important thing about the number is that the decimal always gets put right here after the ones place. All right? Now the factor is 10 to some power. In this case, 10 to the third, okay? So you are going to be taking 1.25 times 10 to the third. Well, 10 to the third is the same as 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000, okay? So basically what that's telling you is that you move the decimal three times to the right, and you end up with 1,250. The reason it moves to the right is because that power of 10 is positive. You can have negative exponents, however, though, too. So what that would look like, if you stay the same example, and now you just move it times 10 to the negative third, that's like taking it times... Uh, or dividing it by a thousand instead of multiplying it by a thousand. So now you move the decimal three times to the left and that's what you have. Okay? That's how scientific notation works. So here's just a few examples of going from the normal number on the left here. These are all normal numbers. Just how you'd write them down. Here's those same numbers in scientific notation on the right column here. Now if you want to look at these for a second, hit pause, but I'm going to move on to the next one. This is the reverse. Here's some numbers in scientific notation, and you start where the decimal is, and because it's 10 to the seventh, you move the decimal seven times to the right, and you end up with this number in normal notation. That's how big the number really is. Pause it if you want to look at these, but I'm going to move on. All right, we're going to skip this part. We're going to move on to uncertainty, precision, and accuracy. The part that I just skipped was a little bit more math than we need to do at this level. So this stuff is all talking about measurement, which is what we do in the lab all the time. It's what you did in lab one. It's what you're going to work on in lab two and pretty much every lab from here on out. So uh, this idea of uncertainty, it basically depends on which tool you're using, and it's basically a way of describing how sure you are of a number that you measure in lab. Okay. So the smaller the tick marks on the tool, the less uncertainty you have. So there, here's a picture of a, a meter stick, or I'm sorry, a centimeter stick, and the smallest tick marks are half a centimeter away. <coughs> Excuse me. So the number here, because you can see where this red line is, if you were to record this as a measurement, it's between 2.5 and 3. So the best you can do is guess. I wrote down 2.7 as my guess. So there's two significant digits because that's my guess. Now this plus or minus 0.5 centimeters basically is saying that it's it's my number somewhere between half a centimeter below and half a centimeter above. That's a way of just covering yourself to make sure that you're not saying a number that's not possible. Now if you're looking at a normal ruler, you're going to see the millimeters on there. This is like a normal metric ruler. And now you can see your number's a little more zoomed in. So now instead of 2.5 or 3, I can see that it goes 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. So my answer is going to be somewhere between 2.7 and 2.8. So the best thing I can do is to make a guess. 2.75. Notice there's one more digit here. This number now has three significant digits. And my uncertainty is a lot smaller now. Now it's plus or minus 0.1, one of these little millimeters. So it's basically saying my number is here, and it could be a below or above by only uh, one millimeter, which is this number right here. So it's zooming in a lot more. <coughs> Precision is very much related. It's the, dis the degree of exactness. So in other words, um, the more tightly spaced the marks are on your measuring tool, the more precise are, which basically says if I gave this same ruler and this object to five different people, if it was a more precise tool, people are going to get answers that are closer together. Accuracy talks about how right it is. So if I know that the value of gravity on Earth is 9.8, and I had a bunch of people measure it, the people that measured closest to 9.8 or the true value would be the most accurate. All right, I'm not going to click on that link, but if you want to look at the PowerPoint and click on the link, there's a more detailed description of these three things. All right, just to give you a visual here, accuracy versus precision. They're similar, but there are some differences. So if you were to shoot a bow and arrow, and the first arrow hit the middle, second one did too, and the third one did too. Oops, back up. Those three are all accurate because they're hitting the target. The target is the center, so they're right on the target. They're also very precise because, as you can see, they're closely grouped, which means that they're one on top of the other, and it's very repeatable. Now, this next example, first one hits the outer edge, second one hits the outer edge over there on the left, and then the third one hits the outer edge on the right. Now, notice, these are all still pretty accurate, 
you know, you can sort of see they're all still touching the bullseye, but they're not tightly grouped. They're on kind of the opposite sides of the bullseye, so they wouldn't be quite as precise. There's a little more variation in where they're hitting. Now this one hits way over there, way over there, and way over there. This one's nowhere near the target. They're all way out here. Not very accurate, however, it's very precise. This would be like somebody who's shooting the same way every single time, but they're just a little bit off. Maybe, um, maybe there's a wind blowing, and they're shooting off by the same amount each time. So the tool is precise, but there's something causing it to read faulty numbers. All right, This one, kind of just purely random. That's neither accurate or precise. All right, here's another example. Uh, if you compare measuring length with a ruler, excuse me, to measuring length with something called a vernier caliper. A vernier caliper allows you to dial in on a much more precise measurement. It measures down to the hundred thousandth of a meter, 0 0.00001 meters. Okay, whereas a ruler goes down to the nearest millimeter, which is only 0 0.001 meters. All right, so you make your measurement plus or minus the smallest number you can be a lot more precise with the caliper. This is the kind of tool that a mechanic or uh, somebody who worked with very small parts would need to use to make sure everything's the way it's supposed to be. Which brings us right into significant digits. Significant digits are determined by making a measurement. Okay, um, I'm starting to go over time, so I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. Here's the rules. Any number that's not a zero, that is significant. Uh, number two, if it's between two significant digits and it's a zero, it's significant, so those two are significant. Trailing zeros after the decimal, always significant, otherwise you didn't need to write them. Um, if it's a number between zero and one, and there's zeros right after the decimal like that, they don't count, because if you wrote it in scientific notation, they wouldn't be there. So those don't count. Uh, the bottom one you can't really see, but it's basically if it's a whole number and you got a zero on the end, it's only counting as significant if it's got a significant bar over it. Don't worry about that last one. So here's some examples. Take a look at those. We're going to practice this in class, so if you want to look at these more, hit pause, otherwise I'm moving on. All right, adding and subtracting with significant digits. Hit pause if you want to read these, but I'm going to show you the examples. So if you measured 43 inches and you added 2.5 to that, your answer would be 45.5. Uh, you round that up because you can only go with the number that gets rounded off the soonest, which in this case is 43, getting rounded off to the ones place. So your answer rounds to the ones place. If you want to take a little more time with these, hit pause. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next one. So here's three examples. Multiplying and dividing. There's the rules. Hit pause, read them, and I'm going to go to the examples. Now, this rule is different, so instead of uh, going with the number that gets rounded off the soonest, you go with the number that has the fewest sig figs, which in this first case is 43. There's only two sig figs there. So if you multiply those numbers out, you get this thing. But you've got to round it off to 110 because that's the number that you would round in order to have only two significant figures. Okay? Leave these examples up. Hit pause if you want to take a look at these. Write down questions if you have them, and we can talk about these one-on-one -on -one in class. That is the end of our notes for the day.